I presume most of you have already heard of optical frequency domes. They're optical sources that consist of a large number of equally spaced coherent laser lines. And they've gained a lot of interest in recent years within the science and technology field because they are useful for a lot of applications, including spectroscopy, datacom, microwave photonics, LiDAR, optical clocks, and so on. Now, in recent years, Kerr combs have been the preferred or the most popular chip scale comb generation technique. And they consist of an optical ring resonator that is pumped by an external laser source. And through four wave mixing, so through nonlinear interactions in this resonator, we get a optical frequency foam. Now, although this technique is very popular, it has some drawbacks. First of all, an optical pump source is needed. And this obviously complicates the integration because we need to butt couple another laser chip, typically a diode laser, to the chip with the resonator. The second disadvantage is that the comb density is typically low. Most curcombs have repetition rates on the order of 10 gigahertz or even more. And although this is fine for some applications, a number of applications require a, a, a lower repetition rate, so a denser comb. And an example is gas phase spectroscopy, because a lot of gases have absorption features on the order of one gigahertz. So this means that we need a, a comb source with a repetition rate of one gigahertz or even less, so that we can properly sample these spectra. A third drawback is that the conversion efficiency is fundamentally limited. One can prove that the power efficiency of such a device can never be greater than a few percent. But that's also a severe drawback. And to resolve these problems, we have been working on an electrically pumped chip scale mode lock laser as a complementary technology. And it consists of an electrically pumped amplifier that is combined with silicon nitride as a waveguide cavity. Now, you may ask why use silicon nitride and not just silicon? Well, because of two reasons. First of all, silicon nitride can have very low losses, which means that we can make large cavities to acquire a low repetition rate, but also that the photon lifetime can be large so that we have excellent noise performance. And the second advantage is that silicon nitride does not suffer from two photon absorption, unlike silicon. And this means we can, in principle, offer high power of operation, which is, for example, needed in optical ranging applications. In this talk, I will discuss the layout of our chip scale mode lock laser. Then I will talk about how we fabricate this device. And finally, I will discuss the performance of our mode lock laser. So let's start with the layout. And in particular, I will discuss how we combine 3.5 with the silicon nitride. Here you can see an illustration of our chip scale mode lock laser. So it consists of an SOI, a silicon on insulator chip, with on top a silicon nitride ring cavity um, shown in dark blue. So these are two 10 centimeter long silicon nitride spirals. And the silicon nitride is cladded with a top oxide cladding. Now, in order to integrate an amplifier, we make a trench so a recess in the oxide so that we can access the waveguide cavity. And in this case, we use an indium phosphide based indium aluminum gallium arsenide amplifier with in the middle a central absorber. One of the challenges of this device is to efficiently couple light from the silicon nitride in the dark blue to the 3.5 waveguide shown in red. And to do this, we use a two stage taper approach consisting of a silicon nitride taper, a silicon intermediate taper, and then a 3.5 taper, which is part of the amplifier. So the light first resides in the silicon nitride waveguide. Then it couples to a silicon waveguide underneath the silicon nitride. And we have the recess that we use to integrate the amplifier and central absorber. And then from the silicon waveguide, the light can couple to the 3.5. And here you can also see a cross-section, uh, which nicely shows you that the mode is tightly confined 
to the active layer, uh, to the active P5 uh, layer. And here you can see a microscope picture depicting the same as I just mentioned, again, showing the silicon nitride waveguides, the silicon taper, and then a 3.5 taper. And here in black, you can see the boundary of the recess. Also note that these, uh, these shapes here, next to the 3.5 taper tip, these are alignment markers that help us to automatically align during the microtransfer printing process. This is something that I will discuss um, later in this talk. All right, so I've discussed the layout of our device. Let's now, now have a look at the fabrication, and that is the microtransfer printing uh, process, which we use to heterogeneously integrate our amplifier. Before microtransfer printing, we need to pre-process pre our 35 device, and we do that on its native substrate. So in this case, we use an indium phosphide layer stack with six indium aluminum gallium arsenide based quantum wells. We pre-process an amplifier on this native substrate, and after pre-processing it, we encapsulate it with a photoresist. And we do this because afterwards we can selectively remove the aluminum indium arsenide release layer. And as such, the pre-processed device is solely supported by these uh, resist encapsulation tethers, so shown in brown here, as you can see. For the target chip, which is our cavity chip, we uh, etch a recess. So just to recap, our cavity chip consists of a silicon nitride waveguide. And underneath, at some locations, there is a silicon waveguide to facilitate the coupling to the 3.5. We etch the recess so that we can integrate our amplifier. And we deposit a thin layer of PCB, that is benzocyclobutane, which serves as an adhesion promoter. So it offers us a higher yield for the microtransfer printing process. And the microtransfer printing process then simply consists of picking up the 3.5 pre-processed device with an elastomer, it's a polymer stamp. As you can see here, this will cause these encapsulation tethers to break. And then we can take this, this uh, 3.5 device and print it in our recess on the silicon waveguide with, uh, using the same stamp. So it's basically a pick and place procedure. After microtransfer printing, we planarize the device again with PCB. And then at some locations, we locally remove the 3.5, a part of the 3.5 and the metal. And we do this to electrically isolate the central absorber from the amplifiers. Finally, we etch vias to access the end contact layer and add final metallization so that we can bias the device. Here you can see the result. So you can see here the central absorber in the middle and around the central absorber, we have two isolation regions where we locally removed the 3.5 and the metal so that the, um, so that the central absorber is electrically isolated from the 3.5 amplifiers. And here on the right and on the left, we have 600 micron long amplifiers. And then you can see here these ellipse shapes. These are the vias that we use to access the end contact layer. And you can again see also these alignment markers that we use to automatically align during the microtransfer printing process. So we end up with five contact pads so that we can efficiently bias the two amplifiers and the central absorber. All right, so let's now have a look at the performance of our chip scale modular laser. So here you can see the RF cone. So it's, we obtained this by beating the modular laser with itself. And we actually have a record narrow line spacing. So our modular laser has a repetition rate of only 755 megahertz, which is the lowest reported repetition rate for a chip scale passively modular laser. So this is very useful, for example, to do high resolution spectroscopy. Also note that this roll-off at, roll at higher frequencies is not due to the modular laser, but is a result of the limited bandwidth of the transimpedance amplifier of our receiver that we use to do this measurement. Here you can see the, uh, that we also have excellent, an excellent optical line width. 
So for that, we, be, we had did a beating experiment with of the mode locked laser output with a Suntec tunable laser, which only had a line width of 60 kilohertz. And you see that this beating has a line width of only 146 kilohertz, which means that the optical line width of our mode lock laser is even smaller than this value. This is also a record for a chip scale passively mode lock laser. And just, uh, it's worth mentioning that to do this fitting, this void fitting, we use the data points above the noise floor of the receiver, so which is here shown in uh, black. Here you can see the optical spectrum of our mode lock laser. So we have a 10 dB bandwidth of approximately 3.27 nanometers. So that means that we have over 500 evenly spaced coherent foam lines. And then finally, here you can see the single sideband phase noise measurement. So this is often done to gain more insight into the noise performance of a laser device. And we added here the one hertz Lorentzian fit and you can see that between 10 kilohertz and 1 megahertz, we indeed achieve a fundamental RF line width around 1 hertz. At lower frequencies, our noise is a bit higher. This is due to environmental and technical noise perturbations. And also at higher frequencies, our noise saturates, which is a result of the wide noise floor of the receiver. Now, what is, is interesting is what happens when we do hybrid mode looking. So this means that we modulate the central absorber with a very low power RF signal, which, is, which has the frequency equal to the repetition rate of the laser. And you can see that this actually greatly suppresses the environmental and technical noise. So it's a, a good way to reduce this low frequency noise from, the, uh, yeah, from technical and envi environmental perturbations. And then between 10 kilohertz and one megahertz, this nicely coincides with the passive mode locking case we again have this one hertz um, fundamental RF line width, and at higher frequencies, the noise also saturates to the noise floor of the receiver. All right, so I've discussed the layout of the, our device and how we combine silicon nitride with the 3.5. I've discussed the microtransfer printing process to fabricate the device and to heterogeneously integrate the 3.5 device. And I've discussed the performance and outlined the noise, the excellent noise characteristics and home density. Now, in addition, not only do we have excellent noise performance and a very dense cone, our device also offers turnkey operation and is actually just a single device. So we have a single fully functional optical frequency cone source that can directly be used for spectroscopy, data comb, microwave photonics or other applications. Now, if you are interested or in my work or you have questions, please reach out. I will be happy to discuss my research results with you.